Good morning. It is a joy to welcome you to worship this morning, and I'm excited about our worship together. And um, we are just grateful that we have the opportunity to worship with people who've been worshiping here for 50 years and others for whom this may be their first Sunday. And uh, we are grateful that we have the opportunity to really exist like the family of God, to be welcoming of people who are faithful or who are curious. And so we are grateful for each person's presence uh, with us this day. And I would invite you to please join me in our call to worship, which is printed in your worship guide, or it's on the screen if that's more convenient for you. God alone laid the foundation of the earth. From the midst of the whirlwind, God speaks with power. Let us pray. O Lord our God, when we cry out to you in distress, you bring us through desperate circumstances. You can quiet the storm to a whisper and hush the sea's waves, so great is your power. Help us to trust you, then whatever we may face, knowing that you will lead us to the harbor we have been hoping for. We offer you our thanks and praise. Amen.
not accept the grace of God in vain. For God has said, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation, I have helped you. Let us confess our sins before God, who will listen and help us in our weakness, praying. Saving God, we confess that our faith is too small, our fear is too great. When we are overwhelmed, we think you do not care enough for us. When life is uncertain and risky, we are not sure we can trust you with our whole hearts. Even when you move among us in powerful ways, we question who you are. Forgive us and calm our fears, we pray. Teach us to trust in your power to save and guide us in every circumstance. Grant us your peace, which is clearly beyond our understanding. In Christ's name we pray. Christ offers peace to our troubled souls. Believe this one whom even the wind and the sea obey. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. As God has given us peace through Christ, so let us be at peace with one another. Holy God, we know that our own words lack knowledge whenever we try to speak of you or to you. Yet we are drawn into your presence and desire to understand all your mysteries. So now, by the gift of your Holy Spirit, speak your words and we will listen carefully, responding in awe and gratitude. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Our scripture readings are from 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and Mark chapter 4. Remember this portion of the story of God as it is recorded in the book we love. 1 2 Corinthians. As we work together with him, we entreat you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you. And on a day of salvation, I have helped you. Look, now is the acceptable time. Look, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, in great endurance, afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, in purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. 
We are treated as imposters and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and look, we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken to you frankly, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our aff affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. And now from Mark chapter 4. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And waking up, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Be silent, be still. Then the wind ceased. And there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The word of the Lord. And now a special moment for children. Well, I thought it was appropriate on this Sunday, which is actually Carol's last Sunday as being a part of children's ministries in a paid manner, hopefully volunteer manner later. <laughs> but uh, Carol came to us. Um, she retired um, from a long career working with children in a hospital setting. And uh, when there was a transition, I heard she was retiring. I wasted no time in talking to her. <laughs> and uh, she graciously agreed uh, to join our staff for a season of time. And it has been wonderful to have you and be a part of our staff meetings as we work on things together, but also wonderful um, just to watch your gifts as you work with children. And uh, so we really appreciate that in the life of the church. Um, and so I asked Deanna... What are some of the things that you have really appreciated about working with Carol? And here are the three things. I limited her to three. There were more, but I limited her to three because we have a full service today. Um, but she kind of cheated, and she would do two at once. So the first one was um, just your loving spirit and the way you're able to be so patient with children um, was the thing that she greatly appreciated. Your creativity with crafts, um, because I have no creativity in that area, but that was really appreciated, and we always enjoyed seeing the crafts that the children made. And it wasn't just crafts, because what those represent is somebody's getting to work on a craft while they're learning the scripture, and I find when it's hands-on and you're teaching it at the same time, there's a greater ability to kind of take in that information and be a part of you. So I think that that's a great gift. Um, that we hope we'll get you to volunteer in. No, I'm just <laughs> so, and then the the other thing she said before I stopped her is, I thought I loved her word choice. Um, that it's not that you're joyful, but that you emit joy. It just comes out of you and is infectious, and other people pick up on that. And so we're just grateful for your service here in the church, your work with the children, and I find that, you know, when we work with young people. It's not a one-and-done deal, that those things last a lifetime. And so you've really made an investment, not just in our church, but in the lives of our children. And so we would just, as pastor, as a congregation, would just like to say thank you this morning. Thank you. <laughs> so I would just like to offer a prayer of blessing uh, over Carol this morning. 
Holy God, we thank you for the ways in which you have gifted each and every one of us in the way that the gifts you've given can be used in the life of the church and in the service of Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you when it was a time when it would have been so easy to say, you know, I've retired, I'm stepping back. Carol was willing to say yes and to step into this gap for a little while. We thank you for the gifts that you have entrusted to her. We thank you for the ways in which she has impacted children's lives. And we just pray that you would continue to bless her in this next season of life. And we just uh, offer thanksgiving to you for all that has taken place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're I'm feeling a little out of sorts this morning uh, just because we had the privilege yesterday of being in Purim, Minnesota. I have never been there before in my life, uh, but we had the opportunity to offer a blessing for our granddaughter, Cora Ann, with uh, Chet and Kelsey and her family. And we got as far as St. Paul last night on the way home, and so we were up at 4.45 to be here this morning, and I'm just like still getting everything together, but it is great to be here with you this morning. How many of us have heard the phrase, it is what it is? Has anybody heard that phrase? Now for the real honest question, how many of us have used that phrase? And no, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> but I didn't realize how old that phrase actually was. And that expression has been around since 1949. And its first appearance was in the Nebraska State Journal um, and E.J. Lawrence, never heard of this guy before, uh, used the phrase describing the difficulty that you faced during the frontier life of rural Nebraska. And he said it this way, new land is harsh and vigorous and sturdy. It scorns evidence of weakness. There is nothing of a sham or hypocrisy in it. It is what it is, without apology. And the phrase, it is what it is, didn't reappear for about 50 years, but became common in the early 2000s, and it was used frequently in sports, and then it worked its way into everyday conversation as was witnessed by the number of people who raised their hands who had heard it before, and those who were getting ready to raise their hands before I invited you to stop. In 2004, President George W. Bush was told by an aide that his opponent, John Kerry, was leading in the polls, and he responded with a shrug, it is what it is. And that phrase is used now in all walks of life, from psychology to business to in the military, even in sermons, as noted in mine today. But one observer notes that throughout these contexts, it is what it is as you, is used as a kind of verbal shrugging of the shoulders, signaling resigned acceptance of what we think is an unchangeable situation. And maybe in our world of always changing realities, we are simply getting comfortable with change and with what we oftentimes experience as unknown. Not always what we think it is. The Apostle Paul encountered more adversity than my guess any one of us in this sanctuary today. And he records, as a servant of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in calamities, in the beatings, imprisonments, riots, labor, sleepless nights, and hunger. Paul's perseverance 
through this litany of tests and struggles and trials clearly shows that he did not take an is-what-it-is view of life. For him, it isn't what it is. In 2 Corinthians, it looks like he's dying. But wait, he's alive. Looks like he's punished, but he's not killed. Sorrowful, but rejoicing. Poor, but making many rich in the faith. The Apostle Paul was not one who would say to others, Oh, it is what it is. He wasn't ready to throw in the towel, but he was realistic. And he always saw beyond the obvious challenge from his current circumstances and could see that there was something beyond that, even if he did not know what it was. And maybe Paul is suggesting that it is not always what we think it is. What is happening to us is not determined, nor is it inevitable in our lives. He writes, see, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. Here the Apostle Paul is citing Isaiah 49, which predicts a time that will come when Judea will be brought back from exile. They probably never thought that that promise was going to come true. But God was faithful in the promises that God made. And so we need to ask ourselves, in times when we are struggling with that which we cannot control, that maybe what we see now is unsolvable and a perpetual situation that in reality is no is not unsolvable. This is why we're better off thinking and saying it is not what it seems rather than it is what it is in resignation. Friends, when we look throughout the Scriptures, and I'm not going to list all the biblical references, when we read throughout Scripture, We read that God still offers God's children divine care. We are never out of reach of God's care, and we need to carry that with us, even in the hardest times of our lives. That God is still present in the momentary trials that we all experience. Nobody gets through life without experiencing trials along the way. And what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. There is that sense of a willingness to endure, to persist, and to not give up. And when we come through those trials, we have a new kind of strength. We become strong in broken places. Have you, ever, have, you ever thought about this, the, have you ever thought about the strength that is found in scar tissue? Scar tissue grows back sturdier and hardier than our normal skin does. And there is a strength in that. It isn't what it seems. It's not always what it is. Could confessing That it is what it is, be courageous, and a thoughtful acceptance of that which we cannot uh, change? Or is it really an abandonment of Reinhold Niebuhr's prayer? And maybe praying this prayer can help us. He wrote the serenity, what's been known as the serenity prayer. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And goes on. And the courage to change that I think the things I can. And then lastly and most importantly, and the wisdom 
to know the difference. There was nothing passive about the Apostle Paul. There was nothing in his faith or in anything he knew about God that motivated him to accept his faith, his fate. And while others saw their lives from a ground level perspective, the Apostle Paul was able to rise above that perspective and gain a perspective of the divine, seeing what God might be calling him to. Even as forces beyond his control tugged at him and pulled him, he assessed the situation as one who was above the fray. As servants of God, we commended ourselves in every way through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet as true, as unknown and yet as well-known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. To casually respond to what was happening around him would have felt like a passive faith to the Apostle Paul. And as we can see, he did not hold on to a passive faith. He was fully aware of how contrary the expression is. To the Apostle Paul, it usually was not. It is what it is. Augustine argued for a view that, we've, that has become known as original sin. That we were born already with sin embedded in us. But he too understood the way out through Jesus Christ. But those are deep waters. Ideas that are needed as, we, as how to reject the what it is, is mentality. And our text this morning gave us some help. That we need to adopt a sense that there is no time like the present. The first, to the first step towards altering one's circumstances needs to be taken. Rather than standing and waiting for something to happen, now is the time to take that first step in faith. The second Others have overcome difficulty and adversity. That we need to remember not only the heroes of the faith like the Apostle Paul who we've looked deeply into this morning, but my guess is that each one of us in our lives have experienced faithful people who we have admired the way that they had walked through the difficulties in life faithfully before God. We need people like the Apostle Paul as an example and an encouragement to us. But we also need those faithful people who we have encountered and could see how God has helped shepherd them through life and hold them up as those are individuals who I want to emulate their faith. It is important, number three, not to get hung up on what others think or say. 
Because those other people who have a lot of opinions and a lot of advice are not the ones who called us into faith. It is God who worked within us through Jesus Christ and called us into the faith. It is God who is the author and shaper of our faith. And that is where we need to seek guidance. Remember the Apostle Paul's words. We are treated as imposters, yet true. The way others treat us has no bearing on our faith. fourth way to reject the what is mentality is don't ever discount the value of community. We were never intended to navigate the storms of life all by ourselves. That our community of faith whether it be our community, whether it be family, whether it be friends, whether it's fellow believers, whether it's a Bible study we are a part of, those communities play a vital role in helping us overcome adversity. All of us needs that small community of people that we know we can depend on, that we know if we tell them something deep that's going on in our life, it's not going to appear on Facebook, Snapchat, or any other social media or conversation. But we have developed a trust that we have those who we can count on over the course of our lives rather than feeling like it's just me and God all alone because God has given those people to us. We need to be willing to reach out for support and we also need to be willing to offer that same level of support to people in our lives. To be that friend who can hear what is going on in your life and you know what's going no further. And you know that friend is going to pray for you and you are going to pray for them. And then lastly, we need to reshape the narrative rather than being trapped in a narrative that somebody else or some problem has assigned to us. Instead of moaning and complaining about the misfortune that we have experienced, we need to change our perspective. Like the Apostle Paul, we need to embrace the trials and the tribulations. We need to understand that they can be some of our most valuable teachers in life. That the problems we experience oftentimes present opportunity for us. We all know the phrase that athletes use, don't we? No pain. That there are times when we experience pain. But on the other side of that pain, God has done great things within us. Even though it was uncomfortable, we have grown. It is not what it is. What it is, is an innovation to grow, to mature, to develop resiliency, to become stronger than we were before. Isn't this the essence of what the gospel communicates? Are we call, aren't we called to proclaim to the world that it isn't what it is? It's shocking to review how much Emphasis our faith gives to the idea that we need not resign to the isness of life. Instead, we are reminded that the good news is all about rebirth. It's all about fresh starts. Think about the Apostle Paul and the others in the New Testament. It's about being born again, not as the world sees us, but being born again in the faith and forgiveness that Jesus offers to us. 
It's being alive even though we were once dead in our trespasses. It's walking in light rather than cowering in darkness. It's about restoration, regeneration, and renewal. Let us never forget the words, it isn't what it is. And so I would encourage us this morning to take a few moments in our own hearts, and I'm going to repeat those last five phrases that help us move beyond that spirit of it is what it is. And as I repeat each one, and I'm going to do it slowly, my guess is that there will be one that you will gravitate towards because you know you need to move on from that in your life. And if that one speaks to you, I would invite you in the moment of quiet that we will share together to invite God to work with you in that area in life, to give you strength and help you move beyond the it is what it is. There's no time like the presence. Maybe there has been an issue or a situation in your life that you have been avoiding and you know needs to be addressed. Bring that to God and ask God to give you the strength and the courage to address it. Maybe you're experiencing difficulty and adversity which is causing you to stray from your faith. But remember the roadblocks that the Apostle Paul addressed, not out of his human strength, but because God was strengthening him and asked God to give you strength to overcome the difficulties and adversity that you're experiencing. Maybe you're in a season of life where you're letting others speak into your life in ways that you should not let them speak into your life. And ask God to help you not stumble on what others think or what others say. Maybe you've experienced that you haven't valued the community of caring people in your life who you can trust like you should. Or maybe you're at a place and you're saying to yourself, I don't have that kind of community. In these quiet moments, ask God to help you lean into the community you have or to help you see who it is that you need to be with in community like that. And then lastly, if you've been living into a narrative that has not been helpful, somebody else's narrative or been negative in your life. And I would ask you to go before God and ask God to help you reshape the narrative, to help you see what God sees, not what others see who did not call you into faith, but what God sees who called you into faith. Ask God to help you see it and then live into it. And then in a moment, we will be led out in song.
Would you please be seated? Holy God, we thank you for the ways in which you have spoken into our lives this day. We thank you that your word, which is a gift to us, that was recorded many years ago, is still alive and powerful and shaping within us. I pray that in this next week, as we may have come to some new ahas in our life, that we wouldn't forget them as we drive out of the parking lot, but that we would hang on to them and invite you into our lives in new and different ways. Not just showing you the things we're grateful for, or the shiny places, but inviting you into the hardest parts of our lives. God, remind us over and over again that you are a faithful God and that you respond to our feeblest attempts to live into our faith ever more faithfully. Holy God, by your Holy Spirit, meet us in these places. God, we just want to take a moment this morning to lift up Carol to you and to thank you for her work among us. And just pray that in this season that will be different, that you would continue to bless her. And we are grateful that she will still be a part of our church, only a little bit differently. We pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. I wanted to share two stories this morning. The first story will help us understand why I think this is so important. And it was a conversation that I was not a part of directly, but it was a conversation that was retold to me. And it was of a young person who's been very engaged in the church over the course of their life, saying, I am done with the church. I am done with the church because of the way it has embraced and become a political tool that is not helpful in our culture anymore. I am done with the church. And so for me, it just gave me a sense of that we always need to be careful. That what we do in the life of the church is lifting up our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because no politician will ever be our Lord and Savior. The reason I lifted that up is because this week, like we do every summer, we have the privilege of hosting a group of bicyclists. And they're all from the University of Illinois, and they're biking across the country for raising uh, money for cancer, but also sharing people's stories around cancer. And so they had left a note uh, for us. Thank you so much for hosting us. We are so grateful to have a place to stay for the night Without, uh, without uh, stay-ins like you, like you, our trip would not be possible. So again, thank you for allowing us to donate as much uh, of, to our beneficiaries as possible. In other words, they didn't have to pay for a hotel, so they're able to take the money they raise and give it more directly to their cause. And so for me, it's an important aspect that we do once a summer of hosting young people who may or may not have a church connection and they feel welcomed in the life of our church. They come into a space that Rick has cleaned uh, beyond what I thought was possible. They stayed in the coach house, um, and we do everything that we can to make them feel welcomed. And so in this day and age where there is such conflicted feelings around, around the way the church has engaged in the politics of our country, we could at least do one thing for a group of 15 students that hopefully one day they will remember the kindness of a church and might be part of a pathway back to faith. And so this morning, as we give our offerings and generosity, I urge you to open your hearts wide to a place that knows no boundaries for our for affection for God and for all God's children. And so let us generously share our provisions in the ministry of the church that reaches out to others.
Holy God, we are grateful that you call us to serve. And you don't call us to serve all by ourselves, but you call us to serve in partnership with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and more importantly, with the Holy Spirit, who fills us with patience and generosity and genuine love for others. We pray that as we return to you, the gifts that you have bestowed on us, that they will be faithfully used in the ministry, not only within our walls, but the ministry beyond our walls. We pray this in the name of Christ, for it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Friends, I would invite just to go ahead and be seated for a few moments. I have a couple of announcements and then just a couple of other remarks that I want to make this morning. First of all, just want to remind you of the Fruit of the Spirit Bible study that will be taking place this summer. Um, it's a conversation uh, through scripture and videos. The wonderful thing about it is, is anybody traveling this summer at all? Yep, we're all traveling somewhere this summer. But you don't have to be there every week because it's a different fruit every week. And so you can just show up for that Sunday, and that will be a ministry to you, and others will appreciate your presence um, in it. So we would encourage you, when you are here and able, to please do so. Um, the next thing is, as you know, in the coach house I've mentioned before, that we're refurbishing the two apartments up above for what their next ministry purpose is going to be. And uh, so I just want to say thank you to all the other volunteers um, who have really, I see the streams of them coming in, cleaning, painting, fixing things in the one apartment. Um, and so we are grateful for that. That one, we have a little bit of a deadline because our new executive presbyter is going to be staying there as temporary housing as she transitions her family here um, to La Crosse, and so we're grateful for it to be used in that way. Um, we do have a deadline to complete it by July 13th, and uh, so if you would be able to um, join on um, June 29th or uh, the 13th of July as they finish the project, please put that on your calendars. And then also Sacred Rhythms meets today at 4.30 in the gathering area. And uh, so we would encourage you um, to be a part of that. Uh, for those who have been, I know you want to go back. And we would encourage others to join um, if they are able to. Um, and then just a few other closing remarks. Uh, if you're visiting with us uh, today, um, I am getting, this is my last Sunday here for a few months. I am going on renewal leave, which is intended to be not only a season of renewal in my own life, but also in the life of the church. Because as a church, I'm grateful for the preachers that we have lined up because it gives an opportunity to hear other peoples communicate God's word to us. It gives us an opportunity to share and minister in different ways, and uh, so we look forward to that. Um, as many of you already know, I am getting ready to engage on a bike trip uh, that's going to be on mostly on gravel roads and mountain bike trails um, going from Canada to Mexico. And uh, it's been funny because I find myself in this place for about two and a half weeks out from being there that the butterflies are getting to be there. And then when I saw that uh, on the bike route this last week, they got 15 inches of snow, and you can ride uh, all four seasons in one day. The butterflies are a little more active, uh, but I'm still excited about it, and I think of those butterflies as nothing different than I experienced before every wrestling match and before every football game, and that's a normal part of the process. Um, and I really am grateful for this time and in my own life um, looking for a season of refreshment, I think re-energizing, and just connecting with God in a space that um, I find God most accessible to me, and that's in God's creation. Mm -hmm. And so I am grateful and really humbled um, by this opportunity um, that as a congregation you've given to me. And I would encourage you and welcome your prayers on the journey, um, not just about my own safety and grizzly bears and those kinds of things, but for God's work in my life, because that's the most important part of it. And I want you to know that you will be in my heart um, and in my prayers. And uh, we'll put it in the bulletin next week, uh, but because I don't have phone service most of the time, um, I will be calling Cami when available and just giving updates to put on my blog um, just so people can see where I'm at. And uh, Donna's going to keep a map out here and just kind of pinpoint where I'm at along the trip, just if people are curious about that. 
So again, just want to say thank you and would invite everyone to stand and join in our song together. Friends, in every circumstance, trust in God, who has great power to save and keep us. And now may the power of God uphold you, the peace of Christ rest upon you, and the Holy Spirit defend you now and always. Amen. <laughs>